Thank you for watching this edition of Local Heroes here on WKFK DTV7. For each week, we bring you a story about a veteran, unedited, unchanged, and in their own words. So join me again next week here on WKFK DTV7, or visit our website at WKFK.com for archive shows about local heroes. Welcome to Local Heroes here on WKFK DTV7, where we interview veterans of the military and we bring you their stories, unedited and unchanged. So don't go away, we'll be right back with a very interesting story from one of our local veterans. Hello and welcome to another edition of Local Heroes here on WKFK TV 7, coming to you today from the GI Museum in Gautier. We're continuing our conversation with Mr. Granville Crane. He is a survivor of the sinking in the USS Indianapolis, he's from Gulfport, Mississippi, and he was a master at arms, second class on the USS Indianapolis when the ship went down. But Mr. Crane, in our last show, you revealed something that's absolutely fascinating to me. When the crates were loaded onto the USS Indianapolis, these men, they were kind of foreign to you guys who were on the ship. And I don't mean foreign men. I just, they were strange, but they were dressed in military uniforms. Right. And you knew that they weren't Navy guys. They're civilians. By the way they acted, they didn't know Navy regulations. No. So what did y'all think about that? We thought they were. Oh, well, well they were. But, you, but they were actually impersonating Navy officers. Yes, they were. So how did you feel about that? We felt bad, but they couldn't even pronounce Navy jargon. In other words, they couldn't even talk Navy. It's good, but idea, you know. They, ah, they, that's how you really ferret yes, people out. Yes, sir. So you're thinking, what is up with this? Uh -huh. Who are these guys? Uh -huh. But they rode the ship all the way to the island of Tinian. They did. And they got off when the crates got off. Yes. Now, when they unloaded the crates, it's my understanding that you didn't pull up to a dock. No. At Tinian, and a big no. barge comes out. Exactly. Now, history says that you pulled up to a dock at Tinian. Uh -uh. Wrong. Big barge comes out, crates go off. Did you feel any relief? Like, oh, gosh, I'm so glad those guys and those crates are gone. You know, we wasn't all that uh, under pressure because we didn't. Exactly, I, we didn't know exactly what happened, what was taking place. We didn't see any or feel any danger, Dub. You didn't? No. I mean, it's just a, another thing to go a phase during the war. We didn't expect any danger to it. Well, after all these campaigns, I don't, I don't guess that was a, danger, a feeling we, of we danger because that. all you were doing was going fast. That's it. <laughs> okay, now you left the island of Tinian, and you were going to get ready for the invasion of Japan. That's where, he, that's where the ship was being that's sent. Where we're. Uh, so you leave the island of Tinian and uh, something happens about 12 o'clock at night. As you're halfway from Tinian to the Philippines, halfway, we were sunk. The, the torpedoes hit us about halfway. Now, Divine Providence probably set in here because you That's went right. to the captain. That's right. Captain McVeigh, mm -hmm. who was a fine man. He was. And you asked him, right. Captain, can I sleep up on the deck? Mm -hmm. And why did you ask him if you could sleep on the deck? Well, it was so hot below. <laughs> <laughs> South Pacific. Yes. <laughs> you wanted to get up there where it was a little cooler. Now, you put a cot in one of the hangars. I did. And you were asleep in that caught mm -hmm. when the first torpedo hit yes okay if torpedo impacts the ship obviously there's a shutter there's a shake there's a, a loud noise and you're awake at that point no, I knocked off the cot what do you think we, we thought the like I said I, we thought the boiler blew up and it happened before but uh, a large explosion of course when the torpedoes hit because the second one blew up our ammunition. They knew exactly where to place that torpedo to the ammunitions, which, of course, that, that killed us here. Yeah. 
Well, the first impact knocks you out of your, your cot. Yeah. You get to your feet, and then all of a sudden, I mean, it's not 20, 30 seconds later, the second impact. That's right. And it's more severe than the first. It, it was. Do you realize at that point, uh-oh, something's really something. bad here? I did. What began to happen after that second torpedo hit the ship? Well, of course, we had trained over three years and a half that we'd go to our battle sh stations, and mine was aft. On the fantail. On the fantail. <laughs> gun and captain. Gun ca well, we just had a lot of men back there that didn't know what to do, so we kind of uh, rounded them up, you know. <clears throat> but we were waiting for orders to abandon the ship because we knew it was going to go down because when it bellied up and like that, you know, we knew it was going down. Only 12 minutes. 12 minutes. <clears throat> <clears throat> so... You're on the fantail. You're waiting for orders to abandon ship. Did you have <coughs> a life jacket? No. No life jackets. Mm -hmm. So the ship starts turning over. Right. How do you get off the ship? How did you make your way off of the ship? Well, like I said, I, I held those sailors as long as I could by telling them, don't jump off. We've been through this before at Okinawa, you know and uh, wait for the captain or somebody to tell us to abandon ship. But that was a mistake on my part. Well, but you were only following orders. I was following orders. Well, Mr. Crane, you were following orders, and you finally get off the ship. How did you actually get off of the Indianapolis into the water? Did you jump? Yes. <clears throat> Doug, we was all <clears throat> so frantic, you know, scared too, you might say. To jump off, we were just jumping off at our leisure time, but we finally <clears throat> jumped off, and I was one of the last ones to jump off the ship. But some of my men that I had uh, authority over were hitting the screws that were still turning. Uh, the ship was still uh, uh, turning the screw, and some of them was killed because they jumped into the screw. And then I was taught in boot camp to swim as far away from the ship as I could, and I, I remember that, and I, that's what I did with the oil slick around me, and couldn't hardly breathe, but anyway, when I come up for air, I saw uh, my home, the Indianapolis. We're going down under the going water. Down under the water. Yeah, that's your home for three and a half years. Yes, sir. The, the most beautiful ship in the United States Navy. I can understand how that would be, but... The water, the water was full of oil. It was. And when you jumped into the water, it wasn't like jumping in a swimming pool. You went way down, and then you had to had come to, back up. I had to go. Now, because it's nighttime, you're disoriented. You really don't know where the surface is. No. But you managed to get there. When you get there, you're, you're inhaling, and you're, you're ingesting a tremendous amount of this thick black oil that you used to burn in the boilers. Did well, it make you sick? Yes, it did. But one good advantage, it, we didn't have a fire on the diesel oil. And that that would have been terrible to have a fire all in around us, you know. To it, yes. uh, so the, we were blessed by not having the fire to cope with. Now, you did not have a life jacket. No, sir. And you were wearing dungarees. Dungarees. And you're in the water, no shoes. No shoes. No way to support yourself. All you had to do was tread water. Were there men around in the water with you? Yes. Could you see them or hear them? I, I could see all covered with oil, you know, slick. <laughs> but um, there were things off the ship floating, you know, the particles like ammunition cans, wooden bo potato boxes and things like that that we held on to. And that kept you afloat? Yes, sir. Was the water cold? It was cold at night and hot in the day. Well, the night goes away, and you're ready for the sun to come up to get warm. That's right. But the sun is up a long time, and you get absolutely burning hot. Exactly. Now, we all know that there was a, this is one of the worst naval tragedies in the history of the United States Navy. It's the worst one at sea, Doug. At sea. It's not... You know, Pearl Harbor was yes, the worst. But the worst. But at sea, yes. we were. But you're in the water. The sun comes up. Did you think you were going to be rescued the next day? You did. We thought that, and we hoped that. 
but it didn't come. At days, the daylight brought our enemy to us. And that was the sharks. We could see them floating and swimming toward us. So this was right at sun, sunrise? The sunrise, you yes, sir. You could see them? Yes, sir. And the way we would keep them away from us uh, <clears throat> is to yell and our feet uh, and our hands, you know, make a noise all we could. And as long as we stayed together as a group, Greg, uh, they would just bump us and go off unless some dead sailor, you know, Marine, would uh, uh, go out from the group. They'd take him down, of course, every time. But uh, we, they were cowards to some extent, the sharks were, because of the fact that we stayed in a group. But let one single sailor go off, he'd always never come back. Now, you, you, your group, how many men were in your group? And was there a lot of people uh, We together? had the biggest group, uh, Doug. We had 300, uh, Dr. Haynes' group. We had over 300 in that group. And Dr. Haynes was, uh, he, was a, he was a great guy. He was, he was. He was swimming around trying to do what he could. Exactly. Uh, so, sun's up. You're covered with with fuel oil, right. you're hot, you don't have anything to drink, No. you don't have any food, no. the sharks are circling you. No life rafts either. No life rafts, no K-Pog life jacket no, at this sir. point. And then you're waiting for the sun to go down to cool off. But when the sun goes down, you get freezing cold, cold again. Cold again. And the weather, you know, uh, the wind was picking up the waves, and it was rough wa water, really rough. So when you weren't rescued at the end of that first day, did you have hope that you were going to be rescued? Yes, sir. I never gave up hope. That's why you're still here. Right. Uh, but my point is, is, is that you still had hope. You still had hope that the United States Navy was sending ships to your location to pick you up. We out. were. But you know, some of those men were making bargains with God. God, if you only get me out of this, if I could only be rescued, I'll, um, I'll do anything you want me to do in making bargains with God. Now, I've been through that before at Okinawa a different time. I didn't make any bargains with God. I mean, the very fact that I, I faced death before, and I wanted to do it at God's time to die and not take my own life or suicide or anything like that. It was the God in me to believe that he will take care of me. I didn't make a bargain with him. So the, you're it, it's the night on the second night, and it's very cold. Yes. And are the sharks around you yes, at night? All the time. They never left. They were there no. in the daytime and at night. Exactly. And men were disappearing. Men were disappearing. By the by, this time are people getting delirious? Yes. And obviously, there's, they're getting delirious because there's nothing to drink. They drink the wrong water. They drink the salt water, and that's deadly. It was. And some of them are at the point where they're delusional. And they're seeing things on the horizon. They they're crazy. hallucinating, mm -hmm. okay, and they're seeing things going on. So they're trying to swim away from the group. Yes. This is uh, bad for them. They never appear again. No. Are you, are you trying to keep your head about you until you don't swim away? Yes. You are. But they still do it anyway. I try to get them to stay, too. I mean, I was trying to help them, but it wasn't myself. Okay. Like Dr. Haynes, you know. Like Dr. Haynes. Dr. Yeah. Haynes was a real, I guess you'd call him a hero. He was. <laughs> he was, was a hero. Real. Yes, sir. We're going to have to take a short break here, Mr. Crane, and we'll be back with more local heroes right after this. Don't go away. You're not going to want to miss the end of this story. Welcome back to Local Heroes here on WKFK TV 7. We're continuing our conversation with Mr. Granville Crane. He is a survivor of the sinking of the USS Indianapolis. And, Mr. Crane, we were talking about you're in the water. You're in the water basically four and a half days. Right. You didn't give up hope. You tried to keep the men in the group. 
you kept your wits about you, uh, but you finally see this airplane fly over, mm -hmm. and it's a Lockheed Ventura, mm -hmm. and the pilot of the airplane actually thought the men in the water, you were all spread out, was mm -hmm. a Japanese submarine. That's what he said. And he was going to drop bombs on you mm -hmm. until he saw the submarine waving. How did you feel when you saw that airplane? Well, we thought it was the real thing, you know, that we would be rescued. But uh, we had that hope that we wouldn't be delivered from that water all the time, those of us that were Christians. But with the sharks around us all the time and eating on our, on our buddies and everything, we were right ready for anybody to help us, you know. And when uh, the plane came and dropped the life rafts and... Uh, the different uh, supplies in, in, in lifeboat, and uh, I got in a lifeboat, and of course I was exhausted and collapsed and everything. I couldn't talk. Uh, salt water sores was all over me, you know. And uh, the USS Bassett was uh, ordered to come and pick us up in that group, over well, 300 men, Dr. Haynes' group, and uh, they. Uh, they took us and they helped us over into the ship, you know, and they were magnificent people. They gave us the red lot, uh, red uh, carpet treatment. They'd give us soup, give us their bunks that they had for their own, and just very good people, you know, that had sympathy toward us as survivors. And they were so happy to see us and clean us up and made us feel like a man again. Yeah. Now, the, the, the airplane didn't actually rescue you. No. The, the, the Bassett was one of the ships that came, right. and they were actually lowering LCVPs into the water. Yes. Did they pick you up at night? Was it nighttime when they picked you up? Like I said, now, Doug, <clears throat> I, I might have said it wrong a while ago. I was four and a half days in the water yes, sir. before I saw the plane. Yes, sir. But from... Uh, uh, another half a day, I was still in the water. Yes, sir. Because they they took that long for the USS Bassett to come and pick me up. But was it at night when they finally got you out of the no, water? No, sir. It was the next morning. It was the next morning. It was the sixth day. So you see the plane come over. You think, I'm going to get rescued. Yes. But then it's nighttime again. Nighttime again. And you still didn't lose hope. No, sir. I had my faith in God. <laughs> well, the Almighty was on your side, and he sure helped you there. That's right. The next morning, the the Bassett shows up, and these LCVPs are put over the side, and they come around within the group, and they're picking you up out of the water. Exactly. And you get on board the Bassett, and uh, according to Mr. Bell, mm -hmm. who I've spoken to, uh, they were actually putting you in the showers and, and scrubbing that oil off. They did at first. Did they get all the oil off of you, though? No, sir. <laughs> I had oil for a long time. <laughs> and the taste of the oil, I understand, stayed oh, with you for months. Puget. Mm. Now, you, you, you obviously couldn't eat or drink a whole lot. No. Now, Mr. Bell tells this story. One of the first meals that he was offered in the mess hall on the ship, he sat down and they put it in front of him. It was fried fish. Mm. That didn't happen to you, did it? No, sir. No. The captain of the ship actually came and apologized to the men for, for serving them fried fish, but he said it was already on the menu and we didn't have time to cook something else. And Mr. Bell says he didn't eat the fish. <laughs> Do you remember what some of the first things you got to eat were? Well, Doug, I couldn't eat solid food. It was that sick at my stomach, you know, ulcerated stomach, kind of the oil, diesel oil. But uh, I had soup and juices for a long, long time until they took me to Samar in the Philippines in the field hospital. And then I began to uh, come to myself. I was still delirious, you know. And uh, I tried to walk, and I couldn't. I fell on my face, and... One man said, to the doctor, he said, son, I'm sorry you lost your hand. And I said, doctor, I gave my hand. <laughs> I can't help you. It's okay, Mr. Mr. Crane. It's and uh, the Lord was with me, I tell you. 
I was saved before I went into the Navy. We had prayer meeting, Bible study the night before, three hours before the ship was sunk. And I believe that helped me to get through the strength of a congregation of men, you know. Yeah. And uh, they, uh, they all prayed before the torpedoes hit. So at sunrise, when the sharks came, we just hugged one another and kicked and hollered and scared the sharks away, you know. It camaraderie. Yes, Staying sir. Staying together. Staying together. Band right. of brothers. Amen. And it reminded me of the people in fellowship of true churches, you know, that they pulled together. Yes. And they wouldn't uh, do anything to hurt one another. But some of them had, I'll have to admit, they had drinking so, so much salt water, it made them delirious, you know. Yes, sir. And they had knives and different weapons that they used, and they attacked it with some of our own shipmates. Of course, you read that in the book. Yes, sir. And that was a, that was a terrible thing to happen. But uh, You had the discipline, though, Mr. Crane, to not drink the salt water. Not drink the water. I knew I couldn't do that. I had that much sense. I mean, I, yeah. I'm not bragging, but I knew better. Well, yeah, of course. Of, he was obviously trained not to do that, yes. but you still were able to make yourself not do it. So that's, you know, that's you know, a lot of discipline there. Now, you, you got rescued by the Bassett. They took you to Samar? Samar, Philippines. In the Philippines, and you were in a hospital. Yes. And uh, how long were you there in the Philippines in that hospital? A long time. Uh, well, not too long because they wanted all of the survivors to be flown to Guam. That's what our orders were. So we were flown to Guam and stayed for conval convalescent until we got a ship to go back to the States. So you were on Guam for quite a while. Quite a while, yes, sir. And you were recuperating. Right. You were getting better, and you Amen. were able to eat solid food, maybe, Amen. and you were able to walk around. That's right. And they were taking good care of you, and then they put you on a ship. They put me on a ship. Mr. Crane, how did that feel to get put back on uh, a ship to go home? I didn't like it because I had that phobia. Like I tell you, I don't like to get on a fishing, deep uh, sea fishing boat anymore. And no, I don't <laughs> blame you. <laughs> I, I, I don't blame you. But uh, they were good to us, and we got back to San Diego where the ship took us. How did you contact your folks at home and let them know you were okay? Because, well, you know, this was in the newspapers back Yes, here, it was. That and, the Indianapolis was lost. Right. Uh, we were lost at sea. What do they call that? Uh, Lost at sea, I forget the three initials they go by. But anyway, they thought we were yeah. lost at sea, yeah. even my mother. Yeah. And uh, Did you get to send her a telegram or something? No, sir. No? It was a surprise to her. They didn't tell me not to, so I got enough money to catch my bus and go home and surprise them and when I walked in. Wow. <laughs> I bet you that was a shock. It was. So you get back to the States, and you get a bus ticket, and you go home to Texas? Texas. What part of Texas was that? Galveston. Galveston, Texas. Oh, it's on the coast. Yes. Oh, no. <laughs> the water's close. But you get home, and you surprise your mom, and you surprise your dad, and you get some time, I guess, to convalesce before, yes. before you're discharged from yes. the Navy. Yes, yes. You lose a lot of friends in this. I did. You mean uh, died? Did you lose a lot of friends in this sinking of the Indian? Oh, yes, sir. A lot of them. A lot of them. You were on board that ship for three and a half years, so you obviously knew a lot of them. I did. And being master at arms, you may have locked them up in the brig a couple of times. <laughs> True. <laughs> but uh, it obviously, uh, everybody that was on that ship, it changed your life. It did. Did. And it probably gave you a, a, a different outlook. How do you feel about your whole service in World War II, including getting that atomic bomb to Tinian and ending that war when you did? Well, 
<laughs> I know you're going to say it was, I was only doing my duty, <laughs> but obviously it was an extraordinary thing that you guys did to get that bomb there so quickly. I mean, you set a record for speed from right. from the United States to Tinian, and you had to be working just overtime to keep that ship going that fast, right. that long. It don't just happen. There's people that make it happen. But, you know, Doug, we don't think that we're American heroes. We were only trying to do, like I said, like you said a while ago, only trying to do our duty, which we did, you know, I guess we did. But anyway, uh, we had a ministry after I got discharged. It was in the ministry of preaching. Yes. Uh, pastoring churches. And that made my life so much richer and so much better that I could help some poor lost soul, you know, yes. that really needed the Lord because I had the experience, you know. Yes, sir. The Lord touched me. Yes, he did. He was there with all of you. All right. So you finally get discharged from the Navy, and what did you do after you got out of the Navy? Well, I looked for me a girl. Ah, there's always one of those, isn't it? <laughs> uh, my wife, we've been married 63 years, you, 62 years. You finally found the girl. Well. And you uh, got married. We got married. There's a long story about finding her because she was in our community. You oh, know. okay. But anyway. <laughs> but you did find her. I got did married. Find, uh, and got married. Uh, went on about uh, doing what every other member of the greatest generation has done since World War II. Right. And that was making the United States the country that we all enjoy today. Well, we tried. Sure well, did. You, did, <laughs> you did the best job. Thank you. All of you did. Thank you, And, Doug. you know, the, uh, the American people owe you guys a debt of gratitude that we can probably never properly say thank you for. Mm. But to put you in that category of the greatest generation is not enough, in my opinion. I'm not going to call you a hero no. because you don't want me to, but I think you are. But um, uh -huh. I want to thank you for coming on the show and thank you for sharing this very poignant and, and moving story with me and, and all of the viewers of this show, Mr. Crane. You are my hero. Well, you're welcome. And I appreciate you. And I thank you for what you did. And I, I owe my freedom to you, well, you guys today. Without you, without you guys, we wouldn't be here. Appreciate that. Uh, and uh, we're going to come back uh, after this, and we're going to hear more from Mr. Crane. He's got a little bit of something that he wants to tell you all about. So don't go away. Stay tuned for the next Local Heroes, and you'll hear more from Mr. Granville Crane, survivor of the sinking of the USS Indianapolis. Thank you for watching this edition of Local Heroes here on WKFK DTV7, where each week we bring you a story about a veteran, unedited, unchanged, and in their own words. So join me again next week here on WKFK DTV7, or visit our website at wkfk.com for archive shows about local heroes.